Air Cavalry Division was not a typical Army division. We're kind of special. In fact, I wouldn't say kind of. We were special, and we let people know it. One mission. Go find the enemy, and we did. One battle. Yeah, we found them, but there was a hell of a lot more than we thought we were going to have to fight. Setting the blueprint for the Vietnam War. There were other battles in Vietnam, and a lot of major battles. But the fact that we were the first one, and we were air assault, was uh, uh, an historic. Acts of courage. And we wouldn't ask our men to do anything we wouldn't do ourselves. You're thinking about what you need to do, not worried about what's going to happen. And sacrifice. So have my company was, was either killed or wounded in a There's only a couple of us that actually walked out. For country. We were doing what our country asked us to do. No more, no less. And for each other. They were all good. They were all heroes. The Battle of the Idrang Valley is one of the most iconic battles of the Vietnam War. It was the first major combat action between U.S. ground troops and the North Vietnamese Army. Way 31 was fortunate to sit down with six veterans who not only survived the battle, but risked their lives to save others. Though time marches on, it's their ability to paint a vivid portrait of war at its most devastating and inspiring moments that ignites the patriotism that lives deep within all of us. This is not a war story. This is a love story, a love for country and service, but most importantly, a love that's forged in ways only a select few can ever explain, a love that will stand the test of time. In the early summer of 1962, the Secretary of Defense directed that a study be made to determine in essence how best to move our troops over normally impassable terrain with the speed that will be required on a modern battlefield. It was called the 11th Air Assault. They had been uh, training and testing helicopters to see if they, they were able to outmaneuver the other units. The test was designed to see if air mobility, first of all, had a future. Could you replace almost all the wheeled vehicles in a unit with aircraft and accomplish the mission. We're going to move combat soldiers, the infantry. Not only the infantry, we're going to move artillery as well. We're going to pick up the, the cannons. We're going to fly them to a new firing base. That was a good way to get around. That was our Jeep. Every, so everywhere we went, we went by helicopter primarily. The helicopters, of course, were I only saw one or two of those flying around in my whole life. I thought it was a great concept. I, mean, I thought it would work very well in, in the jungles of Vietnam. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. That's when we knew. <laughs> it came from the top. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. We already had an idea that we might be going somewhere. Vietnam was being talked about at the time. We were at Fort Benning at the unit when uh, Lyndon Johnson announced he was going to send the 1st Air Cavalry to Vietnam. The 1st Air Cavalry Division, it really didn't exist. 213th Infantry became 17th Cav, and they changed shoulder patches and all that. Morale was very high in the outfit. They were very well trained, disciplined, and willing to do, go and do whatever we required to do. But the whole brigade then was on a single ship. We had 400 helicopters, 15,000 soldiers, and we all had to get to Vietnam by, uh, by boat. The helicopters went on, went on aircraft carriers, and uh, you know we went on merchant marine ships. We were on the Remling Rose, a U.S. Navy ship 
Oh, yes, it's Rose. It got the name Rambling Rose because we ran into a hurricane and then it had to divert around the hurricane. So it took us longer than what it should have taken us to get there and, and the guy named it the Rambling Rose. I can remember getting off the ship, you know, every, and the temperature was like really hot and humid. We flew to the spot that the cab, the whole division, was going to make a home of. And that spot was in, near a little hamlet of Anke. We got there and there's nothing but rice paddies. It's flat, it's open. So the first couple of weeks, the focus was turning this spot in the highlands into a base camp. We're out there with entrenching tools and bayonets, cutting grass by hand. And this is a big area. I mean, it's not like they gave us electric lawnmowers. You can imagine uh, a base camp for 15,000 soldiers and 400 helicopters. We spent a lot of time cutting down, uh, or, you know, chopping uh, fields of fire out in front. We are in, uh, in two-man pup tents. A pup tent uh, is a, a tent that has two halves. One guy has one half of it, the other guy has another half of it. So two buddies, and they set those up and those two guys live in that tent. That's what we lived in for about two to three months. I can remember coming off the back of the Chinook and seeing a big pile of what I thought was trash. But when we got off the helicopter, the helicopter took over, we looked closer and it was actually NVA soldiers where the Vietnamese had been piling them up, getting them out of the wire and getting them out from around their perimeter and piling them up and there was a bulldozer there that was going to bury them. And then uh, that's when the reality really hit you. We moved in, first brigade moved out, and we started looking for the enemy. On the 11th, 12th, and 13th, we're beating the brush, and nobody found anybody. It's a warning order tomorrow morning, which was the 14th. The 1st and 7th uh, is going to conduct a battalion size uh, air assault uh, into an area to the west around the Chupong Mountain Complex. So we had, we had flown over the, uh, the area and um, picked out a landing zone. We pick out the x-ray because it's close to that mountain. And we think, well, if the guy, bad guys are there, you know, it's okay, we'll land here because we're bigger and meaner than they are. Our battalion commander said, "There's, there's enemy out there. We got to go. We got to go get them." And so that was, uh, that's what we did on that. It was a Sunday morning, uh, on the 14th of November. The B company's got to be the first company, and A company second, C company's third, etc. So, on B company comes in first. Hal Moore goes in with the lead chopper, and and uh, he lands, and B company captures a prisoner. I can remember opening up a can of sea, sea ration to eat because we hadn't really ate that morning because we, we started moving it right at daylight. So we didn't really have time to, to eat. That's when I know we had captured somebody in the LZ. I knew that had happened. And I knew they had NVA uniform on because I had seen the, the cactus. Interpreter with Colonel Moore. Uh, interpret him, and that guy said, uh, "There's three enemy. There's three of my battalions on that mountain, and they really want to kill Americans." That prisoner was was uh, just godsend. If we had not captured that prisoner, we could all have been dead, because the plan was to land an X-ray and each rifle company would then go off on its own looking for the enemy in this area. Hal Moore, being the super good CO that he was, 
quickly realizes if we don't hold this landing zone, we're all dead because there's no place to resupply, there's no place to evacuate our wounded, there's no pl place to uh, bring all our firepower to bear. We've got the first mission, the mission has changed. We're not going to be out there cloverleafing. We're going to defend this damn landing zone. Moore grabbed me and said, forget what I told you to do in the plan. You take the company and go block to the south uh, and southeast. Uh, I quickly gave uh, some instructions to my platoon leaders, and we took off, uh, cleared the landing zone, uh, got into the wood line around the landing zone, spread out over maybe 140, 150 meters of ground. And within 20 minutes, the whole, my whole front erupted in fire. The crescendo on the battlefield, you can feel it rising. Uh, it, what starts out to be boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, it starts boom, 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 boom. And then you hear a machine gun. The enemy coincidentally had thought that the South was the best place for them to attack the, the Americans in, in that area. And they, they thought that area was undefended, but because my very well, well-trained troops, uh, confidence in their leaders, uh, reacting quickly. Uh, so we were down, uh, we had scraped just shallow holes in the ground, and the enemy came in and we turned them back flat. Fortunately for us, the enemy never discovers that the back end of this landing zone is not defended. We don't have enough soldiers to defend the back end. A force of that size, at that time, would have been overrun. But they came down sporadically initially, you know, smaller units. Once it was clear that, that we had control of that area, then my next problem was, Jesus, my left flank doesn't have anybody on it. So in moving around, uh, I found a unit from D Company, which was the fourth company in. They had lost, both of their uh, officers had come in with them. They were casually, they were gone. I found a sergeant in charge of those people. Uh, I got Moore's permission to put them on my left flank. So second problem solved. I had a little more protection on my left flank. General Moore, recognizing the seriousness of the situation, had asked the brigade commander for an additional rifle company. I happened to, to walk up to, to the creek bed, and I'm maybe 40 or 50 yards from the creek bed, and there's John and his command group. And he, he looks at me and says, Tony, you better get down or you gotta get killed. Uh, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> I uh, realized that over right up next to me over here is the platoon sergeant of I think our third platoon. And so I turned to him and I said, where's Lieutenant Taft? Lieutenant Taft being the platoon leader. And he says to me, Lieutenant Taft is dead. And I say, well, where is he? He says, sir, he's in the creek bed. His body's in the creek bed. And I said, one of the things I told my soldiers was, we will not leave anyone behind. And I said, well, in that case, I've got to go get him. What happens next that's significant in the battle, is very significant, is that shortly, or uh, I don't know how, maybe in a half hour or something before I go out to bring back those soldiers. John Heron gets told to send a platoon forward to reconnoiter. So we'll gather everybody up and we'll start moving up to go on the right flank of the first platoon. And uh, that's when 
NVA soldiers were spotted coming in from the flank. The platoon leader called me and said, uh, we have uh, five North Vietnamese up here in the woods. We're going to go get them. And I said, OK. So I was the trail board on, on that, and the machine guns were right in front of me. I was going with a Sergeant Palmer. And I said, what the hell's going on? And he said, we're going, we're going. I don't know, where are we going? And uh, so we fell in behind the, the lead squads. And we went out maybe 500 yards or something like that. I don't know if I said, but I, I want you to maintain contact with the other platoon because that's really what we wanted to do. We didn't want to split up. And I didn't realize that he was going to, he was a very aggressive lieutenant. And, um, and instead of sending a squad out to go, because the, there's only four or five of them and we had they were running back, they were, you know, taking off. Instead of doing that, he took the whole platoon running. And my first platoon sergeant said, uh, he, was in, he was in contact with me, he said, where are you all going? <laughs> so pretty soon he hit the, uh, a pretty good force. Once I got him in position, they hit us. This happened quickly. Harry got hit, he went down. Palmer got hit, he went down. We had an RTO, a, a, a forward reserve with radio for the mortars. He got hit. We had a forward reserve from the artillery. He got hit. So all our radios are down. The mortar FO got killed right in front of me. He fell over a log right in front of me. So I reached under the log because when I try to reach over it, the bullets were just tearing up the top of the log. So I reached under it and got his radio and pulled it under there and, I, and started to try to get fire just artillery adjusted in. We'd taken a lot of uh, a lot of casualties and that's when Sergeant Savage took over the platoon because he got the radio. We were trained to to, to take the next next position. Squad leaders and sergeants were and soldiers were, would take uh, one step up. Uh, when people would come off their helicopters, he would kill the, the leader. You know, he'd say, you're dead, and then he'd try to see, see who was gonna take over. I think the training and training, drop, the dropout training that was required all the way down, instilled a lot of trust in everybody in the platoon when you stepped up and you did the job that the guy above you was doing. Finally got artillery adjusted, adjusted in around us. I brought it in very close, and, and uh, they fired a lot of rounds on that platoon. That, that, that's what saved us, with the artillery right in around us. I don't know how long the fight lasted, because time stands still in a situation like that. But finally they did back off a little bit. Carl Moore said, go get that platoon. I think that's what he said to them. But I wanted to go back to the pen get the platoon too. I uh, gather my troops together in the creek bed, not all of them, but a group of them. And I give them a pep talk. And I say, okay guys, we have a platoon that's cut off. These are, and these are almost my words. Uh, they're your buddies. You've been, you were back at Benning with them for a year. You know all these guys that were out there. Uh, they're your friends. Uh, we're gonna go get them. And I say, uh, and they're uh, get them psyched up. Yeah, yeah woo, let's go. I say, fix bayonets and follow me. And we made that one attempt. We were, we were taking casualties, and so we had to pull back. We wanted to get that platoon out of that day. It was starting to get dark. So we made a, a second attempt, you know, uh, with uh, artillery and mortar fire on, on in front of us, you know, tr trying to prep, prep the, the, the area. At that time, I wasn't, didn't realize that this uh, one anthill was uh, holding up everything. So rather than waste any more time because it was starting to get, uh, get dark and I wanted to get up there before, uh, you know, before it got too dark. Uh, I told my men to hold their fire and don't uh, don't shoot me up. 
and uh, so I ran across about 30 meters of, uh, of open terrain and got to the position and threw a grenade over the top of it and then after it went off I went around to the left side and I, uh, there were some more guys in me that were trying to shoot me so I was able to use my M16 and, uh, and silence the, the, the bad guys. And after that was done, uh, I told my men to come on, let's go, we gotta get to the platoon. And they started to move forward, but uh, someone further in the back, uh, another enemy soldier uh, shot me in the jaw. You know, it went in my, my left jaw and, sh and shattered my left jaw and deflected downward. And I always say God works in strange and mysterious ways. Had it been another inch or so, it hit my juggler van and I would have, it would have, I'd have bled out. Well, we didn't, we weren't able to get the platoon. It becomes clear that we cannot, P Company and us, can't get through to that platoon. Uh, there's a lot more of them than there's of us, and they're in that grass. That damn grass. X-ray was not jungle. X-ray was uh, a, a different type of terrain than I had seen before in Vietnam. I call Hal Moore and, and say, I can't get through. We're losing a lot of guys and we can't make it. And he says, okay, pull back. And you know, by that time I've got three dead guys next to me. This stuff lands, and it makes a much more effective smoke screen on these smoke round desks. Much thicker, it's a big, thick, white cloud. But it lands on the enemy side. It scares the hell out of me when it first lands, because I had expected a benign kind of smoke run that just lands and lets out this puffy cloud of smoke. I, no one told me they were flying WP. It landed where it should. It didn't hurt any of my soldiers. But the other guys start, stopped firing. And uh, it, they couldn't see us anyway because it was, that, that really makes a, a very thick smoke. I told Turner and Mazal this because he was the company that was attacking out there towards me that what they did probably saved us but because they pulled the enemy off of us the two times they tried to come out there and they concentrated on them rather than on us. And then I think at that they may have forgot us or got killed. And so Moore um, ordered us to uh, go back. And we um, decided that uh, the artillery would keep those guys alive. They had asked me, could I self-evacuate? I said, no, we have too many people wounded, and uh, uh, we cannot. Pull, we don't have enough people to move our wounded. So we're staying, basically. We had no option. Again, it really bothered me to have to tell them that we weren't going to get them. We had to be careful not just wasting them all now, because we knew we were going to be there all night, and at least I knew that at that point. But uh, we didn't know what was going to happen during the night what kind of fight we were still going to have to do. That was up most of the night, listening to Savage. Yeah, they, they ran into us a couple of times. You know, we had, we had short fire fights during the night. A big unit was moving down the stop out in front of us. I could hear them talking and everything. And, uh, but they stopped right where I had the artillery registration port. When, I, when, I, when the fire had stopped originally, I registered the artillery all the way around the perimeter where I could call for a particular fire on a specific location, where well, they end up being at one of that locations, and that's why I call for a fire on those guys. Yeah, we were concerned about maybe being attacked early the next morning 
uh, when it started getting daylight. If they had attacked us in, that'd probably been it for us. But I knew that the, the other guys were coming in. They were telling me where they were at. Well, I knew they was coming up by listening to John Heron on the tele, on the radio. They couldn't see us, they said initially, because what had happened, that artillery had been called in so close that it threw all of the debris upon us. And we were so well camouflaged, it was hard to see us. Point when I walked up, he didn't see us initially. They walked up right next to me. And that that's when I said, hey man, I'm right here. And he looked down and then he see me. They rose from their, their positions, you know, in the, in the, the uh, dirt and all. You know, they were all, so they, some of them were reddish from the, the, the dirt, you know. Was, so they got up and then it took my whole company to carry them back. The whole company. So we brought them back. That was hard, but, um, the whole thing was difficult. I was happy to get them back. I knew, you know, I knew him so well. That was um, so it uh, hurt. It really affected me. And Ernie Savage won't tell you this, but I will, and John Heron will tell you. From the time he took charge of. Uh, the remains of that platoon. There were no additional casualties and no deaths. They put a ring of steel around their position up there and held out, held out uh, yeah, they, were, they were attacked about three times and uh, they never lost another man killed or wounded once, uh, once they put that ring of steel around them. Yeah, Ernie uh, saved that platoon. I really have a lot of respect for Ernie Savage. Herrick made a bad decision, a bad tactical decision to move away and not do what he was ordered to do. His order was to come up on the flank of the first platoon and, and start engaging the enemy with the first platoon, not to run off by himself. That was wrong. He didn't obey his orders. Sometimes when you make a mistake, it improves stuff, but don't ever count on it. But in this case, it did, because what happened, we stopped a major unit coming down that bottom. I was very angry. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't expect him to take that whole platoon and go off like that. But I must, I must say that based on the situation, he did what he could. And his platoon, in my view, and I think Colonel Moore felt, felt the same way, that platoon probably saved the landing zone because we made contact early when they were trying to get to the hill. That's what they were trying to do. They wanted to get to the landing zone. They knew that we had choppers and all. Um, so that platoon stopped that. No sooner had they gone out than the whole, my whole line opened up uh, as it had uh, the previous day. The uh, main attack hit my left two platoons uh, and very quickly uh, it devolved into a, uh, a serious fight. Uh, they were in our lines, I couldn't use artillery. Uh, there was evidence of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, hunkered down in what was kind of a foxhole, but it wasn't very deep. Uh, I looked up and 30 yards or so out in front of me, where my first platoon was, I saw some enemy. For better or for worse, I decided I would throw a grenade at him, pulled the pin, stood up, and just as I had released the grenade, I got whacked in the back shoulder here and knocked back down into the hole. Came in on an angle on my uh, left shoulder, broke the scapula and went out. Made a mess of the, the meat back there, but uh, wasn't a penetrating wound.
which means that any attack aircraft within the area responds to the location of that call because they're about to be overrun. They pulled the artillery away from it and said they, they were attacking the LZ and they needed the artillery. We almost got overrun at that point because they had really gotten into the Bob Edwards company hand to hand and so on. As Moore says, uh, after two and a half hours of uh, of individual acts of heroism and, uh, and unit discipline, the enemy was withdrawing. C Company started the day with five officers and 106 men. Uh, after two and a half hours, there weren't any unwounded officers, unwounded or killed, and only 40 some odd men, 49 men. Uh, but the enemy had not penetrated our lines. What was left of C Company went back into the center of the LZ as battalion reserve. I'd been wounded, eventually got to the battalion aid station, put me on a medevac helicopter, and my time with the, with the second or the first or the seventh was done. When it was evident that the enemy was throwing and it was, it was safe to do things, uh, Colonel Moore had B Company second or the seventh withdraw from its portion of the perimeter, come in and replace me. The following day, two battalions come in to reinforce us. But the battle, the, the issue then switches to LZ landings in Albany, which is the fight in the second of the seventh. We were on a march from um, X ray to another landing zone called Albany. The mission was to get to that landing zone, to be picked up and, and carried back to our base camp in Anke. The reason we were leaving X-Ray was that they were going to put B-52 strikes on that landing zone. For safety reasons, friendly troops had to be outside of a three mile box. So we were walking out of X-ray uh, on our way to Albany. Second of the seventh, got ambushed, got the hell of crap made out of them. Here we were uh, walking through the woods, in a semi-tactical uh, column when they sprung the ambush, cutting off the commanders from their troops. The safest place for me on that battlefield was back with my company who was at the end of the column um, because these were the guys that I knew. My thought was I need to get back to where my guys are. Some of the units that reinforced me uh, were called that night to go in and get the 2nd uh, of the 7th Battalion, which had been, oh, had been practically a uh, you know, hand-to-hand -hand battle and uh, really, really had a tough fight. I lost 17 treasures. The next morning, we went back into the ambush site and recovered most of the guys. The one soldier that was in my unit that we did not recover, it was reported that, that he was seen being evacuated when they were evacuating all of the other wounded, but it, he wasn't evacuated. He was killed, but not in a place where we, he, his body was easily discovered. So in April of that next year, Hal Moore, who and I flew back out and found his remains. Another one of my demons. You hate to lose folks, you know, and you especially hate to lose people, you know, that are your friends. You gotta remember now, this is just not dang soldiers you got. You've known them for a year, year and a half. 
You knew the family, if they had a family. You knew that if they were married, you knew that if they had kids, you knew that. If you had a guy in your squad, you know how many kids he had, where he was from, you knew everything about him. I knew him very well. And that was hard. That really bothered me. I told us. It's very hard to put into words uh, what you feel uh, about that time. Uh, some people do it better than others. Uh, but it's always there. I'm getting old and I forget things, but I don't forget much about that. You have vivid memories of that. Vivid. I mean, they're still vivid. Something one thinks about. A few nightmares now and then. No. I, I know I never forget it. I'll never forget. I know everything that happened. You know, I know the guys' names. And, you know, I, nowadays I forget names and I, I don't remember a lot of things, but I remember that one. I have some nights when it is difficult for me to close my eyes. And, and I know all 17 names of the kids that I lost. I think of this every damn day. Uh, and it's hard to talk about. Oh, I think I'm most proud of the way the, uh, the men of C Company performed. Proud of the men who were in that company. And no not commission officers. I mean, they all uh, gave, you know, they all performed, did what they could in really difficult situations. The battle itself was the bonding that caused us all to want to go back and see each other and at these reunions. Honored and privileged to be, uh, to be with them. They were great leaders then and they're still great leaders now. And uh, they've, they've led a, a, a very, very good life. And so it's very special to be with them at reunions and and uh, these uh, leadership uh, conferences that we, we go to and attend. So that's uh, very, very special. We're a family. <sighs> because I love those guys. And I tell people that uh, we, we were a tight family before we uh, got into battle, but being with guys that get shot at together even makes it a tighter group. That bond is never broken. I mean, you may, you may bond with a friend or something like that, and at a later date, you're no longer friends. But with a fellow veterans in a battle like that, they're always that close brother. The extremely high regard that I have for the American soldier, he is the best fighting man that I have ever seen. And I would like for you, if you convey anything out of this area where we've been for the last three days and nights, Please convey to the American people what a tremendous fighting man we have here. He's courageous, he's aggressive, and he's kind. And he'll go where you tell him to go. And he's got self-discipline. And he's got good unit discipline. He's just an outstanding man. And having commanded this battalion for 18 months, You must excuse my emotion here, but when I see some of these men go out where they have, I haven't, I can't tell you how highly I feel. They're tremendous.
Every generation, every war uh, ha has people that rise to the top. I was fortunate enough, I and, and the rest of the people that served with, with General Moore, Colonel Moore, uh, we were very fortunate to have him. He, he just made the right decisions. And, and <laughs> he was a great guy to work with. He was a dynamic speaker, first of all, and he cared about soldiers. So he, he was not only a good leader on, on the battlefield, but um, after the battle, because that's when I really got to know him. He was a great American, and he was, uh, he, he was uh, first in and, and last out uh, of the battle. And so that's, you know, that's the way you know, he wanted us to be too, and that's the way we were. He was right there with us. You know, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't ask you to, to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. Yeah, he led by example, and uh, you know we have a we wear a patch that says "Follow Me," uh, and that's that's what he did. The fact that uh, Tony Nadal had had so much had already been been to Vietnam with the Special Forces, uh, he was an obvious one to take that company over. I'm glad he did. <laughs> uh, it was really, really great knowing he was on my left at that battle. He was just a, a great leader and a great commander, and he uh, he led by example. John Henry was a great leader. Everybody loved him. He was very proficient, very tactical, very laid back, cool. Uh, and everybody liked him and they trusted him because he was technically and tactically proficient and you can't ask for any more. Bob Edwards and I both uh, recuperated from our wounds at an army hospital. You know his personality. <laughs> I never thought I was gonna die. Uh, I, I knew that I'd gotten wounded back there. I couldn't move my left arm. But other than that, I was healthy. At one point, I thought I was going, they would patch me up and I'd go back to the first and seventh. I can remember telling Colonel Moore, as they evacuated me, save me a job. You know, Battlefield Commission, they did that in World War II a lot. And so Colonel Moore pulled me aside and he said, what do you think, John? I said, I don't want to lose this guy. <laughs> because if they really made him a lieutenant on between some other unit, some other unit. Plus, I said, I didn't think he was really, uh, he was a staff sergeant. I think that probably wasn't quite ready for it. And I don't think Bernie said has ever forgiven me for that. <laughs> People often ask me about, well, how much courage did it take for you to do whatever? It didn't take courage because I was trained to do my job. The battle was in 65, then my award was 13 months later in, uh, in a cold December day, the 19th of December. Uh, 66 and many of my soldiers that were in the battle with me had uh, came to the Medal of Honor ceremony. I'm the caretaker of the medal for all the brave men that I serve and, and women too. So I'm, I'm the caretaker of the medal uh, for them. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't ask my men to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. But uh, you have to lead by example. And, uh, and so I'm very, very fortunate to have served with such a great group of American soldiers. And, uh, and this is as much their medal. There's so much action that goes on, on in combat. It's very hard to record it all. And I'm very, very fortunate to be the caretaker of the medal for, for them. The two helicopter pilots, Bruce Crandall and Ed Freeman, uh, that that took us in and did uh, lots of brave things uh, were awarded the medal. 
you know, later on uh, uh, for their actions in that battle too. It's one of the few battles in Vietnam where there are three uh, medals of honor awarded in, in, in one battle. The Band of Brothers, Henry V. We few, we happy few Band of Brothers. He who sheds his blood with me will always be my brother. And uh, it's perhaps overused, but but to us in the ranks, it's very meaningful. Uh, these are my brothers. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold the man who cheat, quote, and he speaks, that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. That fought with us in LZ X-ray. The men who fought in the Idrang Valley defied the odds. The courage they exhibited, putting their brothers' lives in front of their own, is what defines them. It's what makes them something they won't call themselves, but they will call each other heroes. You're invited to meet these very men. They'll be in Huntsville on Tuesday, May 9th, sharing their stories. The money raised from this event will benefit Huntsville's U.S. Veterans Memorial Museum and the Army Heritage Center Foundation. For ticket information, visit waytv.com. And don't miss your opportunity to witness oral history and to do your part to preserve their legacies. You've been watching a Way 31 documentary, Unbroken, the bonds forged in the Ayatrang Valley, proudly supported by Calhoun Community College. This has been an exclusive presentation of Way 31 News.